you think is way too hot? <laughs> Welcome to the Kiwi talk. My name is Jan Monschlegel. I work in uh, imaging topics since about half a year or three quarters of a year. And I'm going to show you uh, what Kiwi can do for you. First of all, I'd like to ask uh, how many of you actually know what Kiwi is? Oh, quite a lot. I see. And how many of you use it to make images? Two, three, four. It's also quite a lot. If you want you if you want to tell something about the images you are creating, I'd like to know that. Well, live image. Uh, live image and ISO or USB? Excuse ISO images or USB images? ISO for now. ISO. But uh, USB in the future. Okay. And how about you? USB because you can have your hard drive basically with you and just carry around like music and your documents. Basically your operating system with you if you have a USB. Great. Great. One, one or two um, power users here in the room. I won't probably tell you many news because you already had all the pain that you can have probably with the configuration. I'm going to talk about this. Um, my de demonstration is, uh, presentation is uh, split it in basically three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about the history of Kiwi, how it was developed, why it was developed, by, by whom it was developed. Then I'm going to um, give a very brief example what Kiwi can do for you. If you don't already know this, you too may fall asleep during that minute. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about what I do for Kiwi, because um, we wanted to, to give a new, new functionality to Kiwi that it does not have at the moment. And I'm heavily working on that. So I'm going to talk about, I think, five minutes or at least five minutes about what I'm doing. And if you wish, I can show you a current configuration file. But we'll come to that later. So first of all, introduction. What is Kiwi? Uh, Kiwi is a, a command line based toolkit, which means it has no nice GUI, no, no, nothing to click around. But uh, for that reason you can integrate it in the toolchain process. So when you have a build system, for instance, and want to create ISOs automatically, you can integrate uh, Kiwi calls in your scripts, in whatever scripts, bash, Perl, whatever. And it is usable as a base tool for high level uh, applications. So if you wish uh, to make a whatever QT or web frontend to generate your configs, you can do so and run Kiwi as a backend, which is a really nice thing. But Kiwi is not a product, so there's uh, no point in, uh, we don't sell it as, uh, as is and as a complete tool. You can integrate it and it's still under development and you will probably find bugs. So I can repeat what Saifi said, bug reports, bug reports, please file bugs. It's uh, in, the, in the Novell wiki, uh, Novell bugzilla. It's uh, open source org system imaging. I have this not in my slides, so uh, but you'll find it probably if you search for Kiwi and Bugzilla. <coughs> the original program was developed by Markus Schäfer. The original plan was that he gives his talk about his part of Kiwi himself, but uh, he cannot attend for private reasons. So I'm taking this. And his original idea was he wanted to create a USB stick, just like Francis. He wanted to have this system to go and boot whatever machines he could for his um, and carry his data with him and uh, just have his, his uh, special system on every hardware that he has. Then later, um, James Wilcox, aka Snore, in the OpenSUSE Kiwi channel, is uh, has the, the Thin Client project, which is uh, targeted to uh, provide an image as small as possible. And uh, Gigi Schrobel, aka Cyberorg, is uh, in active development for the uh, LSTP project, which is um, the German LTSP. LTSP. Oh, I misspelled that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. And um, I joined active development in, in April and wrote my modules. You won't find my code in the in the repository at the moment. Just one small module that I use for some utility functions which are subject to change, of course. And as soon as my code works, I will commit it. It's not, nothing secret, it's just not, not yet operational. But it will take two, three, four weeks, maybe. Of course, I will get back to this in the third section. 
So the uh, current project status is an uh, overview uh, who uses Kiwi at the moment. The um, SUSE Linux Enterprise Point of Sales project uses Kiwi to create images. Also the, the Film Client project is an official pro uh, product made with Kiwi. And some hardware vendors uh, use Kiwi to make uh, preload images that they can dump on their disk and give to their customer as a pre-installed machine. We actually have one preload by Lenovo. Uh, we made this with Kiwi. It's released. And I mean, they made it with Kiwi. We, we, taught, them, we taught them how to use Kiwi to, to, to find all these problems that you have when you use it for the first time. We figured everything out and now they are using Kiwi to make their uh, product. And there are some community projects. Um, actually, uh, if you ever tried a KDE live CD, this is made by Stefan Binner, AK Binary. Uh, he also uses Kiwi. And whenever he has some questions, he drops over to me because he lives in the room next to mine. Uh, and of course, any, any user who wants to create his custom system can use Kiwi to do so. And yes, uh, exactly, that's what I mean. Um, you tell me if anybody has, I asked that in, in the front, and I know that uh, Zyfe, for instance, used Kiwi to make, a, to make a rescue system, which is very interesting. Me again, um, it's the, an, an, an old X32 ThinkPad, which has no drive. And I really regularly update to the latest Optimus factory code. And in the evening, before going home, I have to call my colleagues, well, moment I need to reboot first. Because what if the update kills the kernel or the bootloader? I'm sitting at home, I, for some reason I need to reboot the machine won't boot, I won't have a drive, I can't risk recover it. So I did the, with Kiwi a live booting USB stick, which I just use as a recovery, uh, instead of a recovery CD. I did a recovery boot stick. And uh, right now it's the, when you try to show it, the X server doesn't start up for some reason. Probably I booted it on a different hardware last time, so I need to. But, yeah, but we have one that boots. I'll show yeah. that later. <laughs> and, and, but it's actually it's a much better rescue system because it's so cool. It has M player, it has all browsers, it has everything rescue you need. System. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's, it's much better if you can <laughs> listen to the MP3. If you Every can listen to the MP3 music from the one partition while your file system check is checking the other partition. Oh, yeah. So that's really really cool stuff, and I really appreciate it. So yeah. you can use it for more than it looks. So it's really cool stuff. Zaifi is one of the guys who really gives good input. He comes sometimes, drops over to my office and says, yeah, couldn't we do this, like that, blah, blah, blah. And he has really good ideas on that topic because of that rescue system. And of course, but I don't remember that you ever reported an enhancement bug on Kiwi. Uh, yes. <laughs> In my office, yeah. <laughs> I see you, you had a question? Uh, when you were talking about the history, um, does the name actually have a meaning? Or you mean the name Kiwi? Kiwi come from? That's one of the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to ask Markus himself. He, okay, he just, I think he, he told me once, while we drank a cup of coffee, he told me it's just because it sounds nice. Okay. He, didn't think of, he didn't think of the birds, because when you look at the Kiwi, uh, and the official TV website, I can show it right now. I plan to show it anyway. Um, if network is, yeah, the network is still up. Um, we have the official TV website at values.de, which actually has a picture of a fruit, yeah. as you see. And he calls the, the Kiwi community, uh, the developers, Smart Cyberhawk himself, and me, the, the fruit lovers. <laughs> so, this is the official web page. Okay. Now, we're going to uh, how does Kiwi work. If you want to use it for the first time, you have to do several things. Um, because there's no uh, really brief overview, I collected some useful links. Uh, we had we had often trouble that people uh, installed Kiwi and started to, to edit wrong config XML files, namely the ones in uh, user share packages, Kiwi, uh, user share Kiwi images. And these config files must not be edited. That's why Markus um, provides some examples. 
since Kiwi version 1.99, he has two examples that you can use as is. And we have the official OpenSUSE Live DVD things checked in in Forge SVN. And that's why I collected these links. The website is, uh, was just a quick hack written on uh, Thursday to collect all the links for the download repository. So you can get uh, examples. This two examples are in the, in the normal documentation. You get this if you install the Kiwi package. And the OpenSUSE images are in, in Forge SVN1, where you can... That's nice that we have network here, actually. And you can take this uh, KW Live CD configuration file. This is a good point to start if you... Uh, should open this with... Oh, it works. That's how a configuration file looks like. This is quite long. I'll explain a, a shorter example later. So, what's, what else is on the website? We have uh, links to documentation. First of all, the documentation that comes with the Kiwi package, which you'll find in uh, user share doc packages Kiwi as Kiwi.pdf, which is really, really, really well written. This is one example for really good documentation, I can tell you, because uh, Markus uh, wrote a lot of documentation and he was convinced by Thomas Schreibler to use this, uh, to create it with DocBook. And it's, it's really well written. You can write your own documentation if you have something and uh, put it in this. And we wrote some uh, real life scenario tutorials. When I made the preload image, I uh, wrote a, uh, something about the preload and about the USB. This is actually my contribution to this docu. And in a few weeks ago, um, Thomas and uh, Markus started to write a, a quick start tutorial, which you will find in the build service documentation, actually. This is in, uh, in this link. You will find, uh, find the books, the end, and there's a quick start kiwi. The problem is that the PDF is not in the repository, so if you want to build it, you have to check out that repository, you have to install the SUSE doc package, which should work by now. We found out that it doesn't, you can't install the package from the online repositories due to missing, missing <coughs> If you have the DVD, you can install it, but I think the package got fixed on Thursday and will be available through the updates. And you can take a look at the comp at the, the free stuff because of course I have a, a compiled version with me, and which is really an uh, autodidactive way because it doesn't start with technical details. It starts with uh, how can you do, how can you create, what is Kiwi, and what do you need. It tells what what packages you have to install when you want to make ISO images. When you want to make a USB images, there are different sub packages. And it has some sample calls that you can execute. You can use, for instance, he, he shows these two examples which you already have installed, and you can just go there and use these configs and run commands which you find in this documentation, namely these. And this should work if you have a valid installation source. So it's pretty straightforward. Just take a look at this quick start guide and get started. So, um, basically, you have to install a Kiwi package, Kiwi tools package, and Kiwi desk ISO boot, Kiwi desk USB boot to make ISOs or USB images. There are some others for thin client, there are some for the WISE terminals. You probably have to, don't have to use them ever, but if you have a WISE terminal and want to make an image for that, you have to use this. It's also available. Your main job is to create the config XML file, with the, the one I showed you before. Uh, you can start from scratch and create your own, or you can uh, just take one and modify it. That's the usual way. You check out one, you take the KW, KW Live DVD, or you take the... Um, some other that you like or is almost what you need and just tweak it a little bit and you get your own image. Uh, the build system looks like this in an overview. You need uh, source repositories for the RPMs as input and you need the config XML file basically. 
you also need some other files um, which are shown in another slide. You need a build host with at least about uh, 5 gigabyte is sort of minimum. Better is 10, better is more, of course. Um, that you don't have to delete the old image to create a new one and have enough space on your disk. And what comes out of it is an image. This is not necessarily a CD, actually. It's just a nice symbol. The image can be a virtual machine image, or a USB image, or an ISO image, and among some others. So it's just because it looks nice. OK, that's a slide explaining sufficient resource, especially hard disk. Of course, it helps if you have a lot of memory. I built an image on a machine with 512 megs. It took, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, and the same image on a 1 gig machine took 20 minutes or less. So memory matters and uh, hard disk drive. It's the main main. You don't need a quick CPU. The configuration directory contains several files. The most important one, config example, containing every information that your image needs: package list, repositories, um, usernames, user IDs. We can switch back to this. I can explain it on an example. Where was it? Here, I think. Starting with um, image tag containing description, who made it, is the contact, the name of the image, then the preferences specifying which um, boot images should be available. In this case, ISO is the default. But you can also use as an option OEM image, which is used for the preloads, and DMX for virtual machine, same for same kernels, or USB for the USB. Stick. One warning at that point: uh, if you make USB sticks and you install Kiwi, you may have a you may have a machine without SquashFS and without AUFS. You have to install these manually. They are not required by the package. Markus says he, he he says who wants to make USB and uses SquashFS he probably knows what he does, and the package should not require these. Um, then you specify version, size, um, what package manager you want to use. Uh, actually, they support uh, Smart and Super. Both have some issues. There are some things better in Smart, some things better in Super. Sometimes it doesn't work with the one, but with the other. And when you use Super, the version is important. You must have a recent version of Super. And uh, yeah, that's package management is a topic for itself. Um, in this particular uh, case, we have two profiles for KDE and GNOME because Kuno used this um, configuration to make the KDE, uh, the OpenSUSE Live DVD, which is one for KDE and one for GNOME. But the main thing which you have to do is the packages section here. You have to specify which packages uh, shall be installed in the image. You can use a, a package list if you have one. You can specify a package name for each package, which makes the list very long. Or you can use OpenSUSE patterns, which are resolved, but sometimes you run in trouble with that. And you can specify packages that you don't want to install by saying uh, ignore name. When you have a package that you know it's not in the repository, but is required <coughs> by some pattern, then you say ignore and it is ignored. I don't think that we have an ignore here, but I can look in the... Yeah, as we see, uh, Kulu used the package list and didn't rely on the patterns because they uh, cause trouble sometimes. If the, especially if your installation repository and the pack and the uh, the pa uh, patterns are not in sync, which happens sometimes when you build with the with the leading edge repository. So that's pretty hot in here. Okay. Now, I'll briefly give a, a real-life example. Imagine the following situation. You wrote a program for your diploma thesis or whatever and have to demonstrate it. On, uh, say we have a distributed system, you want to demonstrate something which has, which has client-server application and you need two machines for this. Your prof says that uh, you have uh, two machines in the lab, but he cannot make sure that they are installed correctly and you can't be there the day before filling with the machine. Then in the evening some other guy comes, uninstalls the package that you need and you run into trouble when you give your demonstration, nothing works and you fail. 
which is very black and white, of course, but it it doesn't look good if you have a if you have a half an hour demonstration and need 20 minutes to set up your system. So what you can do is uh, you can create images for both machines and put your own package, your own software that you wrote into your image. You don't need to do anything more than just booting it. This can be done in two ways. Um, the most convenient one is if you have an RPM package, then you just uh, link your... Uh, and the, the best way is, of course, to have this in the build service account. I have to say that because I'm on the build service team. <laughs> um, then you just register this uh, particular build service repository as an additional installation source, require your package and build your image. Everything's fine. If you have no um, RPM, get a build service account and make one. <laughs> if that's too much work, of course you can you can tweak your package in manually by uh, just adding every <coughs> every uh, bit of software that you have <coughs> manually copying files to user bin or user share something, which is more work maybe if if it's a simple program it's less work of course, and it's also possible and it's not so complicated because you can. Uh, use overlay files which are copied as, as you provide them on your image. I'll show that in the, in the, in the config tree later. So the, the scenario is that you have a, a mounted DVD or a mounted online repository. You have your build service home project containing your package. You have a build machine using Kiwi and you create your own image on USB stick that you can boot and make your demonstration from hardware and you don't you don't have to care about what the machines are, you don't have to prepare anything the night before. You just plug in your USB sticks, boot from them. Of course you have to make sure that the machines actually can boot from USB. Some old machines don't. And then everything's fine, you get a A++++, if that's possible. And now I'm going to, no, first of all I'm going to show the, the um, structure in the in the demo. As you can see here, this is a, a directory, this is the demo. Uh, oh, I wanted to show this one. Excuse me. This is a very, very, very basic example uh, done by Marcus. This comes with PV. You have basically the config XML containing all the information that we talked about. You have the config sh, which is a script that runs after the uh, base system is installed. And you have the root folder. Now this is interesting because um, are we already running out of time? Thank you very much. You have a root folder containing etc folder, and in this etc folder you have some things sysconfig, and these files are putting the image as is. So you can override the default images by them. If you want some uh, some file lying in user bin something, you just put it under that root folder, root user bin something, and it appears in your image as is. So this is how the second way how you can get your own programs into the image. How do you take care of um, ownerships and permissions of the files? Do we have to set them correctly? <coughs> yes. yes. That's one point for uh, which was discussed recently. Uh, Kiwi runs as root, uh, as root. You have to run Kiwi as root. And uh, I think the all of these files belong, actually belong to root. You can look at that. The root folder. And uh, yeah, everything belongs to root. So you, you, can, uh, you can change the ownership of these files, and I think the image contains them with the right ownerships. But I'm not absolutely sure about that, so you may want to ask this on the mailing list or on the ear channel. If you have to know this for some purpose, not just curious. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but if you, if you have to know that, um, drop a mail on the mailing list or just ask in the OpenSUSE TV channel. Some guys will be around and help you for sure. No problems if you use SE Linux. If I use SE Linux, which is uh, uh, security and security. security. Ah, and I don't know about that. Sorry. You, but you may come, you may drop a mail on the on the Kiwi Devil mailing list for that and ask Marcus. He can probably answer everything. 
because he knows he knows the code in he has it in his brain. I don't know. So, um, what else can Kiwi do for us? Now it's getting auto built. Interesting. It's about uh, how we create our products. We have a system internal called AutoBuild, which is our <coughs> package and media factory. We have uh, build clients, and we have a scheduler running, collecting build RPMs in, in uh, raw trees. We have trees for each architecture containing all the RPMs. And uh, to make a product out of this, you have to gather one uh, installation repository, which is when you use Kiwi at the moment, you have to provide one. You have either you have the DVD or you have the online repositories, but you have to use a, a fixed repository with uh, metadata that you can install from. And this is a weak point because um, Kiwi actually cannot create uh, repositories. This is what I'm working on. I want to teach Kiwi how to make our repositories, to put some uh, automatism and uh, uh, auto build functionality into Kiwi that you will finally be able to create your own installation repository from, from raw RPM directories, from uh, other repositories, from uh, directories containing plain RPMs with no metadata and no version information and nothing, and finally create one, uh, one repository and applying some uh, overlay mechanisms you say you want, uh, you have ten repositories prioritized from one to ten, and you want to take packages from the one with the highest priority first. But you may want to override for some special cases. You have a package in, in in priority one and priority five, and you know you want to use it from the priority five repository, no matter that it's available in the other one. And you have to put all these information in the in the config XML file. And I write a module that handles these problems. And uh, that's why it says not yet, because yeah. it's work in progress. Um, I think I already told that. Uh, yes, yes. I should have shown this before. Uh, product creation at the moment is what I told with the, what the Autobill team does. Um, creating installation repositories, creating images from that. There are steps, you have to create metadata, you have to collect packages, you have to resolve dependencies in, in parts to make sure that everything is installable. And finally you have an installation repository from which you create uh, FTP repositories, DVDs, BitTorrent files, whatever, that we distribute as such. And the new uh, the new approach will be that we have a Kiwi module and we have to expand this, the syntax of the config XML, we have to put more information into it. This is already done. I need, I, I'm working on a module that uh, evaluates this data and creates the repository, which is still work in progress. And we have priority for repositories when you have 10 repositories and you have files in, in more than 10 have files which are in every repository and you want to take it for a, from a special one. Then another important thing is uh, that we need script hooks. Um, some packages have to be dealt differently. Um, installation images, for instance, is one of them, which has to be unpacked, and then a script has to be run after it, and has to do certain things, moving files or copying files. So we have to provide script hooks that you can, can write a script, provide it in, in some uh, URL, and which is one after the package is, is uh, downloaded and copied to the right place. And, as I said, you have to allow exceptions when you make a, something for... good example is if you have a, a two architectures for 64-bit and 32-bit and you have some 32-bit some packages that you need on the 64-bit image. <coughs> for instance, if you want to use Firefox with the Flash plugin. That's one of the problems where you have to, I think you have to install the 32-bit Firefox and the 32-bit Flash plugin because the 64-bit Flash plugin doesn't work with the, for some reason. And you have to be able to provide these exemptions. That's just one exception, there are some others. And we still, of course, we still need auto build knowledge, but we have to find another way to put it into the imaging. There's some automation done. And I can show you a, a current file what we ex ex attended the config. 
because I have one with me, which is, uh, is it this one? Yes, this one. This is one of the files that I use. Uh, that's why uh, that I use for for testing for my. The main uh, thing is the new tag inst source. Uh, within the inst source, we specify. It looks ugly at the moment because it contains a lot of, a lot of comments. Uh, the main thing is the inst repo, where you specify a repository and a priority for the repository and for FT. Username and a password, and in this case, some location in our local system, and some other, which is a KDE build service repository. And here we have a local local repository on the hard disk of the machine that I'm testing with. And I provided a, a package list, which is down here. It's very simple at the moment because I wanted to resolve some some issues with the resolving didn't work in some cases. I just include two packages and test if these packages are available in all repositories. I have to make sure it's picked from the right ones for the right architectures. It must be available for all, all architectures that you have required. <coughs> so this is a really beginning edge work in progress uh, testing environment. And another interesting part is the metadata tag, which is beside, uh, which uh, specifies uh, meta packages and meta files. And for meta files, we have the, the script hook here. We say a target is the directory where the meta file is copied to and extracted, and the script uh, which is run after it. In this case, we have a. This is a bug actually, because I, I changed that to a full path to, uh, to non relative. Rules because we said we provide a full rule for the scripts, but uh, probably copied it a week ago or so. So um, when this module is finally finished, you'll be able to make your own repository, not only your own image but also your own repository. <coughs> the problem is that there are rare use cases for the community because um, you probably don't have your own auto build running and. Uh, Maybe interesting if you want to make a repository uh, for when you have, say, 10 or 15 RPMs that you want to distribute with your own uh, with your own CD. You will provide a, a, a consistent tree with metadata, everything correct, and this package is included. Of course, you can do the same task with uh, with an online repository that you build your image from. So it's mostly internal. Nevertheless, I'm going to commit this to the Kiwi repository when it's finished and when it works. You all may look at the code and, and report bugs and tell me if it's rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that your opinion. Is <laughs> <laughs> I know you would say that. Doesn't work. Yeah, doesn't work. Yes, that's RFC 1925 again. Yeah. It has to work. So what? And now. Finally, if you have time, you don't want to go to the lunch break yet, uh, you may ask any questions. I try to answer them or redirect you to the person who can. <laughs> and it plans on YAST integration? Yes, and there is actually a YAST module called a YAST2. I almost forgot that, thanks for the question. The YAST add on creator. Uh, no, the, the YAST product creator, sorry. The YAST Product Creator is a front-end module written by Yishi Superman, um, which is uh, basically a front-end to create a Kiwi uh, config XML file. So you can actually test this and uh, put some, uh, you can put your own packages in there and uh, create your own image. And it basically creates a metadata for an installable repository based on an existing repository with existing metadata. It does not work with plain RPM trees. But it's still it's it's already available here. This is actually uses Kiwi as a backend. I should have mentioned that in the first section. And the follow-up question is there some relation uh, with AutoYAS since it uses a pretty similar XML <coughs> file to create the configuration of the installation target. As far as I know the AutoYAS is completely different. Okay. It's something that uses completely different format.
the auto yast file is just uh, creates creates a large Z file from from an image and it, it does use some sort of uh, some sort of XML file, but it has nothing to do with Kiwi. That's for sure. So there's no connection between the auto yast and the pro, uh, product creator. Well, it would have been nice since there are some similarities, for example, with package selection. Yeah. If, the, if you create a package selection for an image file or a target system that you want to automatically install, it would be nice if there is some yeah, basic possible. Basically, I think they should just both use the, the usual package selecting GUI you have in Yast right. and just use this as a module or something like that. So, so if, if you have to create an image or create an auto yes. Yeah, then you, you have a module. Basically, probably the, the installer would have to be extended to be able not to install but to just write it. Package list. Yeah. Might be pretty trivial. I think the product creator actually uses the same module. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also think the, the I've used AutoYast once, the, the Yast module mm -hmm. the Yast module for AutoYast. Yeah. I used it once and it looked very much like the package. Yeah. <laughs> we already discussed discussed this internally, by the way. The, 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 if we can merge something from AutoYast and Product Creator. I think it would make yeah. sense. But I don't know how, how, what's the time, what's the plan to, how fast this should be integrated or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You said the um, product creator creates the XML file. Yeah. Um, is the, do you still then have to run Kiwi from the command line to then create your image and then dump your image onto the USB stick, for instance? You have, to, you have buttons in the product creator which runs Kiwi without you don't notice this. You don't have to run it manually. If that's what you mean. You have a big create button, and it does the right <coughs> thing. It's the do the right thing button. Anything else? No tricky questions from you, Saif. Okay, show it. Then, first of all, I'll show my my very last slide, which is a collection uh, of ways to reach the Kiwi developers. This one is the Arduino channel of the Kiwi, which is <coughs> usually has uh, at least Marcus in it, Francis I saw sometimes, uh, myself and Snort and Cyborg and some others interested parties. Then we have a, you can ask on the build service mailing list, which is not at the moment not the right place for Kiwi questions, but may become, you can reach me through that mailing list for instance. And uh, Marcus runs two lists, uh, Kiwi users and Kiwi devil on the uh, list values.de. And of course you can drop me an email on Marcus. And any question that I can't answer, I redirect to him. So now we can show a, a system actually booting from USB. Okay. I didn't hmm? try it, so... Because you didn't try it. Didn't you said it works. If it doesn't work, I'll, I'll hit you. This side. Where's the connect? This side. This side. Yeah. And if you want to show, if you want to show your rescue system, you're welcome. Just, just this is just a call it rescue system. <laughs> This is the, the boot sector. When you start booting it, it should. Yeah. The init are being in that case is a, is a plain shell script. So, but do you also use grub on the USB stick as the bootloader? Yes. Um, actually, it's on this laptop, it's uh, quite close to the process. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. some laptops are always with that. It's a slow stick on this little machine, right? This stick is quite fast. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't boot this machine from USB because the device doesn't support it or it's disabled for some, some hidden submenu of submenus. Does it do anything? Yes. No? Press escape. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Press escape. Yes. These outputs come from the from the KV init RD shell script. Uh, you see, checking file system, writing file system, you can partition. If you boot the USB stick for the first time, I think the um, file system is created on the, on the home partition, which takes a while.
Sayed is a raw image with uh, Firefox and now it's uh, the full desktop with all updates. The full desktop with all updates. So it's a, a Sykes Hyperconfig script, is that? Yeah. Okay. But I guess only for the first time, what? Yeah, 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 yeah but unless, unless you provide a con uh, reconfig system uh, equals one as a kernel option, then it runs it. Reconfigured by one, of course, yes. Wasn't it reconfig system? Or re Actually, I had that problem that it's <coughs> it only configured the X system at the first boot, and I wanted my rescue system to use a more than one machine. So I said, I need this option, reconfigure equals yes, or we're not sure how the option actually is named now. But we needed an option that just forces it to reconfigure X. Right. Different, different and different hardware. It's just a much better rescue system. You can surf the internet. If you put the right packages on it, you can listen to MP3 music while it's happily checking your file system. So it's much better than the old thing. I like it very much. That's why I use it. Is it the wireless? Yes. 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 Yes.